The Secrets of Star Trek is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, Episode 82. Captain DeBridge. Spock here. Make it so. Surrender is not an option. Attention crew of the Enterprise, this is James Kirk. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the Deep Space Nine episode, Captive Pursuit. Joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going, Dom? Very well, thank you. And Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Folks, if you can, please remember to like The Secrets of Star Trek on Facebook at facebook.com slash Media. Follow us on Twitter at SQPN and, you know, leave us comments and engage with us on social media. We really do appreciate that when you do. So this is a another first season episode of Deep Space Nine. It was the sixth episode of the, of the season and uh, originally broadcast in January of 1993. Kind of give you a, an idea of when this was. And it's um, an episode that is inspired by the 1924 short story, The Most Dangerous Game. Oh, in sure. Which, mm-hmm. yep. In which a castaway <laughs> is on a remote island is hunted for sport. Um, and which this story, which is adapted for screen and other places many, 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 many times. Yep. Yeah. It, it, the kind of the definitive screen version is a movie that was out in the 1930s. That the Zodiac Killer was obsessed with. Ooh, interesting. Yeah, but then it's become a cliche on television that you just oh, yeah. okay, this is their this is their danger, most dangerous game episode, and, right? And of course, uh, Voyager didn't just do an episode of it; they created a whole race, the Herogen, <laughs> right? That are exactly this, right? They in, in several episodes. In fact, the the much of this, much of the Herogen, seem inspired by this episode. Frankly, to, I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't. To be honest with you, right? I would say this is one of my favorite or first season shows of yes. D- DS9. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of interesting stuff to think about here, and they give the most dangerous game a twist that makes it way more interesting and puts it outside the typical cliche treatment of it that you see. That's right. One of the reasons I really like it too is that this is this is O'Brien's coming out episode in the sense of not in that sense, but in the sense uh, of no, his debut. It, his it, debut. In the old the old sense of coming out was women right. would have a they would be debutantes. They would debut. They would have their coming out party mm-hmm. in society. Right, and this is where we really get to know O'Brien, his personality, his humor. You know, a lot, much of what we know about O'Brien through the rest of the series. Really comes out of this episode. This it's where right. his personality is established. That's something that's kinda of hard to hard to remember after watching all of DS9 and everything and how central a character he becomes, that he was a very minor character yep. on the Enterprise. Yeah. I mean, he showed up maybe a couple of times a season at best. Yeah. He pulled he put well, he pulled some virtual levers. They by that point they didn't actually have levers on the transporter. But yeah, he was just a background guy. I mean Good for Colin Meany to get to get the upgrade to DS9 and a, a full role. So let's get into the episode itself. It starts with this very odd scene that just comes out of nowhere, then leaves never to be seen again. Frankly, it's what the writers sometimes would call pillar filler um, <laughs> when they when they needed an episode to be lengthened. Michael Pillar, I don't know that he wrote this, but it's the kind of thing. Michael Piller would write these character moments that didn't really relate to the story, but were shed light on people's characters. And so this is Piller filler. Yeah. And, and they put this one right in the teaser, which is interesting. And uh, it's it's a Dabo girl complaining to Cisco about Quark sexually harassing her. In, in fact, writing into her contract that she has to engage in sexual relations with him. Right, although they dodge, they repeatedly dodge saying exactly what the contract right. requires her to do. Right. But she says it's right here in the Ferengi print, which is a great 
you know, Star Trekization of fine print. Right. Exactly. And and I've used that ever since I saw this episode. I'll talk about the <laughs> Ferengi print. <laughs> well, and it's it it's very interesting that this could never be done today because Quark would never be able to be a good guy after this point. You could never treat him as a as a character of any good point because if he does this sort of thing, you know, in this right. meet post Me Too era that this character would have to be anathema. He'd have to be a villain. Mm-hmm. Um, he, yeah, he's always he's always played as a heel, but a beloved, liked heel. Right. right. And, well, after this point, we do still see him sort of make advances or whatnot, or, you know, proposition. Uh, I don't think we ever really get back to this whole, like, where he's basically, you know, he writes into the contract. I don't think this comes up again, I don't think. No, and Cisco makes it clear this is never going to be enforced and I'm going to deal with this. Yeah. Right. So, she, off screen Cisco dealt with it, it never happened again. DS9 yep. has sort of trafficked in this sort of the, the characters who you think why is this guy a good guy? So we did that with Odo, who was the mm-hmm. the, the the policeman for the for the Cardassians. Mm-hmm. You know, he was a collaborator in one sense with the Cardassians. Then you got Quark who, who sort of collaborate with the Cardassians and then does stuff like this. And so you have these gray characters that are, mm-hmm. and, and of course, yeah. uh, um, Which uh, makes them, makes them interesting. If everyone yep. was just a, a total, you know, shining squeaky clean person, like on next gen, yes. mm-hmm. it's less interesting. And if they're just total bad guy, black hearts, you know, then again, that's less interesting. Right. Well, I mean, think think of Goldicott. He becomes mm-hmm. a very much liked character, but he's he about as bad. bad as they come. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but and he he's goes sophisticatedly bad. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Right. And Kira's a terrorist. You know that that whole thing. So yeah, mm-hmm. it's very very interesting. So uh, the uh, Cisco's meeting with the, the Dabo girl gets interrupted by a alert. The something's coming through the wormhole, and we're at the point still where. Anything coming through the wormhole is unusual enough to warrant a right. red alert situation. Well, they, they talk about later in the episode of, you know, it's a very busy now there at the station. There's four or five ships going through in a week. <laughs> yes, right. But this guy's saying is... our highway's busy here in Malta, I think. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they also say this is the first ship that's come through that they didn't send. Right. So it's right. their first visitor from the uh, Delta Quadrant or Gamma Quadrant. So this ship is in trouble. It's uh, been damaged, and it's uh, and and the pilot acts suspicious when they get him on the comms, and they they won't be transported. So they bring the ship in via tractor beam, and O'Brien goes to meet him alone at the airlock uh, in order to uh, assuage his, sus- his suspicions. Um, the alien looks kind of like a Jim Hardar, doesn't he? You, oh, I. Uh, he doesn't have the the more reptilian, but the, yeah, yeah, he doesn't have the like ridges. And right. spikes that make Jim Hadar kind of look like humanoid pentaceratopses. Mm-hmm. Right. He doesn't have that. But he's still reptilian. Yeah. What he looks like to me is is a cuter version of bat of the Batman villain Killer Croc. <laughs> hmm. Well, I have to say, they they did. We were talking before the show about how uh, Baby Yoda in the Mandalorian has been probably been designed to be cute. I think they made they softened some of the reptilian features, like especially on the nose, to make it more like mm-hmm. a dog's nose. To mm-hmm. kind of soften our our uh, attitudes toward this creature, this this alien, uh, probably very very psych- likely to make yeah. us a little psychologically disposed toward him. And I think the uh, I think the look that he has is really nice. I think this is a good yeah. uh, makeup job. It is yeah. better than a lot of the alien makeup jobs we see on Star Trek. Right uh, now, one of the other things that that reminded me of the Jem Hadar, of course, is the cloaking. In fact. Uh, mm-hmm. When the Jem Hadar introduced later on, they it is specifically said in the production notes that he cloaks just like Tosk. Like that, mm-hmm. there's supposed mm-hmm. to be maybe maybe there's some connection. Maybe the founders have used Tosk in his species as or or the hunters, the, which we'll get to know later on, create the Jem Hadar for the founders. So that's right. interesting. And, and the also, I noticed I had in my notes that he Tosk. That's our alien. That Tosk has been genetically manipulated, and I immediately thought mm-hmm. of the founders, you know, right, right. because they manipulated the Vorta and the Jem Hadar, and it's their thing. And so I could easily see the founders coming up with the Tosk species. Right. And now they don't say that. It's in, the the people that are hunting Tosk, who we'll meet mm-hmm. later, are clearly related. 
You know, yes. they're 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 they makeup. They're not the same exact species, but they're clearly related based on their makeup job. So you could just say that they engineered the Tosk species. Right. It wasn't the founders. Right. Well, I, I think they they even kind of implied that that they were the ones who. I mean, it was implied. It wasn't explicitly stated that they the they were they the ones them. that yeah. right. bred them and, to be. And, and and that may be. And the Dominion doesn't get mentioned here because at this point in deep space nine they hadn't thought of the dominion yet that's what i was that's what i was wondering if you know behind the scenes as they're doing production the idea of the dominion war and the Gemidar were maybe at best somebody's concept that was kind of kicking around the back of their head but nothing beyond that yeah nothing they they didn't have it as part of the plan of the show at this point and but in hindsight this fits so well with the dominion Mm -hmm. it's I, i i i was watching and and i thought you know, how plausible is it that we would get through this episode without them mentioning the Dominion? Because it, it's not clear if they're part of the Dominion or not. Right. And I, by the end of the episode, all of the interaction is so focused on the hunt that I could, I think I could see them getting through this episode without mentioning the Dominion. Because right. really, the hunters are all about Tosk, and Tosk is all about being hunted. And so I can see why the Dominion wouldn't come up and these people could still be part of it. There's throughout it, there's this assumption that the humans on the other side of the wormhole understand everything of their culture, the hunt and how the Tosk are treated and everything. There's this assumption at the beginning until they realize later they don't. So I could see them saying, well, they know about the Dominion. Right. Doesn't everybody? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That sort of thing. So. O'Brien meets Tosk at the at the airlock, and he, he tells him, that, you know, we'll fix your ship. We'll have you on your way as soon as humanly possible. And then he says, that's me, by the way, human. And it's nice that they don't just let the idiom slip by, as they so often do, mm-hmm. you know, this right. un, unexplained, that, that O'Brien does, like, say, by the way, humanly possible, that's me. I'm a human. Uh, so I, I kind of like that. that that's little, what, what uh, we call ourselves, no. yeah. Yeah. And, and then he uses that as an entree to ask, what's your species? And he gets, I am Tosk. Right. And and no matter what he asks, the answer is, I am Tosk. And we gather that this is supposed to function as his name, as his species designation, as his job, as his social status. Right. So Tosk is a concept that just totally defines this guy. And I, um, I, I think Dom and I both just had the same thought. I am Groot. I'm Groot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But he he says it to O'Brien like O'Brien should understand this concept. Right. And then when O'Brien says, what does that mean? Tell me about it. He, he can't. And he can't explain. And so this is kind of a plot hole for me. We will later find out that Tosk has taken an oath as part of his professionally designated prey status. He's not supposed mm-hmm. to tell people about what's happening with him. I guess maybe because they would feel sorry for him and want to help him or something. Right. And it would just complicate the hunt. So he's not allowed to tell people about what's happening with him, but he's totally allowed to announce, I am Tosk, and (laughs) say it like people ought to know what this means. And in his society, Tosk are like held up as the noble lion that everybody admires, and they're the, you know, king of beasts, and they're so noble and wow. And but if that's the case, just looking at well, you don't have to say I am Tosk. Just looking at a Tosk will tell you what this guy's role in society is. So well, I, I got the I got the feeling too, though it's it's not even so much of being that position in society, but by saying I am Tosk, he's saying I am on the hunt. I am being hunted. You know, it's more than just I am of this yeah, race. I am of this but, culture. But even then. People in his culture know what a Tosk is, and if Mm -hmm. he's saying, I am Tosk, they're going to know. That means I'm being hunted. So why can't you explain I am being hunted to someone you encounter if everyone in your own culture would know immediately what's happening from I am Tosk? Because it's it's a lot easier to write. Well, I think it's because you're not supposed to—it's not that he can't tell people in their own culture. He can't tell aliens. Right. Because they would help because they don't understand. That's the obvious retcon, but— but even then, that's not how they talk about it, because it, they, yeah. when we meet the hunters, the hunters are like, why don't you understand this concept? Surely you have the same thing. Right. Well, you, you know, to, to yeah. throw in another movie reference, first rule of Fight Club. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, uh, O'Brien. I'm uh, sorry. We can't. We can't talk about Fight Club. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, so uh, while uh, while Tosk's ship is getting ready to be repaired, uh, you know, some techno babble happens. Um, O'Brien gives Tosk a tour of DS9, and in addition to talking about four or five ships or five or six ships a week, he talks about there are 300 people living on the station now, which is not very many for a station of that size. Yep, it's apparently mostly an industrial center. By the way, as he's escorting Tosk out of his ship while they're waiting for its reactor to cool down, a security device that we will never see again after this episode yep. goes off. <laughs> right. And also, O'Brien has brought a phaser with him into the ship that he, when Tosk realizes he's armed, because that's what the security device picked up was O'Brien's phaser. Right. Right. And Tosk is like, you brought a weapon in there? And it's like, well, it's not like I might not meet someone who could turn invisible. Right. But <laughs> here's the thing. Look at the holster that he's got the phaser in. There is no oh, yeah. strap on that. Nope. A, yeah. it, Tosk could just totally reach over and take the phaser. And because that has never happened in many, 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 many episodes of Star Trek where somehow the bad guy gets the phaser. <laughs> right. Well, it's, it's better than, with, than Kirk with that attached by Velcro to the back of his belt. <laughs> yeah. get knocked off so also as soon as as soon as he's alone in the quarters that o'brien puts him in even though he doesn't need or want them the first thing he does is say alexa show me where the weapons are stored right. and exactly. it does and it yeah. does yeah. and tells yeah. him the exact security level he needs to fake to get into there yeah i i that's in my notes too. why would someone just be able to find out where the weapons are stored on board even if access to the room itself is restricted like it would just say no i'm sorry i can't tell you <laughs> like yeah. it just is, doesn't make any I, sense. I'm sorry you can't find that information, and the the security has been alerted that you have yes. tried to find it. They will be here in three minutes. Yeah. This this should be sending up security alerts, and right. and and furthermore, uh, why aren't they remotely surveilling this guy? They don't know anything about him. If uh, he's for the science first... alone, yeah, they would want to study him. Exactly. And then O'Brien is admitting he's suspicious of the guy. He knows he's hiding something. And you're not taking the simple precaution of monitoring his Google requests? Right. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, his ship was, somebody attacked him. His ship was damaged from being attacked, like, very clearly. So uh, one of the things I like at this point is O'Brien is constantly making these jokes, like these offhand jokes, and they're all going over Tosk's head. Like, like mm -hmm. your buddy, he's undeterred. He's still going to make the jokes anyway, because it's, it's, it, He's because O'Brien's a dad, and he's making you know you make the dad he's joke dad jokes because yeah. it's funny for you, not for the person who's receiving it necessarily. So mm. he takes him to Quarks, <laughs> and uh, this is where we have R and R. And Tosk notes that humans sleep eight hours a day and rest and recreate for parts of the rest of the day. They have too much downtime, is what he says. Because Tosk yeah. apparently only needs seventeen minutes of sleep a day. Um, and then he I says, do, "I do like I love how uh, he keeps calling Quark barkeep." That uh, O'Brien, yes. I, I'm a, I'm a, hear, you know, I've got, I could hear, of course, he's got the, you know, hear your concerns and worries and everything. It's like, yeah, with those ears, no kidding. But it's just, <laughs> I love that where he keeps calling him barkeep to bite, despite Quirk's Wants to be called objection. your host. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, Tosk, Quark offers to let Tosk go into one of the hollow suites and Tosk says, I have no need for fantasy adventure because I'm living the greatest adventure of all. The uh, most dangerous game, you might say. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, so Brian, I, I, I love though. There's Tosk yeah. gets one of the best lines in this scene because O'Brien is warning Tosk about how Quark will try to exploit his vices, and Tosk innocently says, "I am sorry, but I have no vices for you to exploit." <laughs> I just love that. That's such an awesome line. Yeah, and then Quark's... Quark's like, "I sense a challenge." <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so uh, so O'Brien admits that he likes Tosk despite him keeping something back. Some he's, he's really he has a sense that he's not telling everything about himself. And Cisco says that if uh Tosk if Tosk doesn't want to reveal anything about himself when his ship is repaired, they have to wish him well and send him on his way, even though he's the yeah. very first person from the Gamma Quadrant. Well, I, I I agree they can't keep him captive against his will, but why are they fixing his ship for him with knowing this little about him and knowing he just came out of a battle? They could, by the way, I like the fact his ship is a ram scoop because yeah. that's a real mm -hmm. thing. That's real science. I, I like that. Yeah. 
but uh, they, for all they know, they are helping a criminal or a murderer or a terrorist. And whoever's following him, if it's the police, they're not going to be happy. That's not going to get diplomatic relations with the Gamma Quadrant off to a good start. You want to be as neutral as possible, not just help people. Prime Ooh. directive. Prime directive. Well, this is this is the, the <laughs> this is the boys the Boy Scout Starfleet. Yeah. Right. Right. We we help anybody who shows up. So uh, Odo now catches Tosk messing with the security junction and takes him off to security, uh, where um, Tosk, when O'Brien confronts him behind, you know, in the in the cell, Tosk asks O'Brien to let him die with honor, although he won't say anything about why he's doing what he's doing. And O'Brien's like, I'm, I'm not going to kill you. <laughs> yeah, he's he's saying, you must let me out. You must allow me to die with honor. And so I have in my notes at that point, O'Brien will let out. <laughs> right. Because after you've had an appeal like that, okay, this is Chekhov's gun, not right. Mr. Chekhov's, yep. the playwright. And yes. <laughs> he's going to be let out by right. O'Brien. Exactly. Yep. And this is where the, the, the episode, the, the big turn comes. Because this now the second ship comes through the wormhole. Um, and it's some it's related to Tosk, similar technology and design. Uh, don't respond to hails. They scan the station, knock down the shields, and then beam on board, which is a pretty scary uh, thing mm -hmm. because apparently Federation technology has no defense against the hunters at all. They could just yeah, conquer the or Federation. At least the, the, at least the defenses on the station. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And when they beam on board, it's like three Marvin the Martians. From right. Looney Tunes. I mean, I'm expecting an earth-shattering kaboom at this point. <laughs> oh, you make me ever so angry. <laughs> so there's, there's this phaser battle on the promenade until they blast their way into the security office. Now, Interestingly, Odo says he never uses phasers. Well, well mm -hmm. in fact, he never touches a weapon through the run of DS9 after this, uh, mm -hmm. Odo. So it's very interesting. interesting. They, they very clearly made this character as he, will, he, he is a, the constable without a weapon. Which is interesting. He he is the weapon. He is yeah. the weapon. <laughs> yeah. He could uh, smother anybody you want. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> right. Among other things. He, like, you know, think of the, the uh, Terminator in the oh, second yeah. movie. Uh, mm -hmm. So the hunter uh, who shows up is a lot, like we said, a lot like the Herogen in Voyager, but looks a lot like Tosk. And he expresses his disgust and disappointment in Tosk being captured alive. And I, I, I kind of, I, I, I find this thing interesting, this part of interesting because here we have a truly alien culture, uh, mm -hmm. you know that that Starfleet doesn't understand who, and it doesn't understand Starfleet and Federation mores and mores, and you know they think differently. They they look at the yep. the universe differently than we do, and I, I kind of like that they've they've allowed these this species to be different. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we don't have the usual kind of Federation preachiness. I mean, not yet. <laughs> Cisco is like this is horrible, right? But. Once it's realized that Tosk really wants this, I mean, yeah. we might say, well, you've been genetically manipulated and that's pitiful, but what do we do in this situation? Right. right. And actually helping Tosk to fulfill what he wants to do is, you know, something that um, that happens. And so we don't have Federation morals triumphs over everybody. This other culture, as much as we might not agree with it, is allowed to do its thing. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And then the other culture, they were willing to say, well, we understand you have a problem with this. That's fine. We just tell them as long as they stay out of your playground, they're fine. Yeah. And and, and the, the hunter says, he doesn't have a name. He's just the hunter. Right. The hunter says, you know, we'll stay away. We'll make the, the, the Alpha Quadrant out of bounds for yep. the purposes of the hunt in the future. Right. Well, they, well should, that should satisfy you, right? Are you happy now? Now, there yeah. is a bit of a, there is a bit of a, um, morality tale here that the producers are, or the writers are making about big game hunting. I mean, this is kind of what mm. we're, this is a, mm. kind of about big game hunting, the, the, how barbaric it is. That's, I mean, Cisco kind of mentions it, even as he says, right. but this is your culture and we can't, it, well, can't stop he, you. He, he also say, he says many you know, human cultures have hunted game, have in, indulged in blood sport and hunted game, and some still do. Right. right. That's true. So- you know, we, we are told that the Tosk are intelligent prey. The hunters consider the Tosk noble beasts that are courageous. And the, the, the hunter says he is sentient only because we have made him sentient. He has, he has been bred for the hunt. His entire reason to exist is the hunt, to make it as exciting and as interesting as he can. And, and, 
and, and, and that's what he wants to do. Right. And yep. he, he wants to fulfill his purpose. He wants to be the, the prey. Um, so, uh, which is what makes this interesting because if it were just, they're hunting an animal and that's bad, it wouldn't be nearly mm-hmm. as interesting. Right. Exactly. And, and the, the, the O'Brien appeals to Tosk. Look, this will all change. You just have to ask for asylum. Then we can protect you. That's different. But if you if you know if you don't ask for asylum, then we we can't. Our hands are tied. Um, and Tosk, you know, stays. No, this is what I want. And then so O'Brien goes to Quark's, and and Quark wants to be the barkeep and <laughs> listen to his problems. <laughs> and uh, he, O'Brien takes what Quark says as advice, even though Quark doesn't actually give any advice. Well, right. it's because O'Brien cuts him off. He's right. about to give him advice because what O'Brien is doing is he's complaining about the rules because the Federation has one set of rules and the Tosk's people have another set of rules and they're not meshing. And Quark starts to say rules are subject to interpretation, which suggests right. finding a way of harmonizing these rules. And that's when O'Brien cuts him off and says, oh, of course, I can change the rules. Right. And thus he, yeah. he does exactly what Quark was about to suggest, which is find a creative way to mesh the two rule sets. Also, this is the second time O'Brien has cut somebody off in the middle of something in this episode. Earlier, when they're having a briefing about how suspicious Tosk is, even though mm-hmm. O'Brien likes him personally, uh, Julian starts to suggest that he give Tosk a medical exam, and O'Brien just cuts him off without even acknowledging that Julian was saying anything. Right. Exactly. He just totally steps on his line. And it's funny and it's and it it says something about where the character of Julian Bashir is at this point in the show. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, that's his but, only half line of dialogue in the show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It also though and I think they mean it, mean it to be funny. I think they're, you know, they're yeah. they're kind of like, "Oh, here's Julian being humiliated a little bit." Uh, by O'Brien without O'Brien even noticing right. it. But, dude, you're a non-com and he's an officer. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Really? You want to do that on the bridge in front of everybody? Well, uh, that's the, I think they did it, too, to kind of establish O'Brien's character that he's one of these that when the wheels start spinning, he, he's not really listening to anybody else. He's, you know, and he thinks out right. loud and, you know, and so it's just like he didn't even hear Julian starting to speak. He's just like, oh, hey, we could, you know, here's we go, you know. Right. It's it, it kind of like Clint Eastwood in Heartbreak Ridge. He's the gunny who you know who is outwardly deferring to the officer, but really he's in charge. <laughs> now, to to be fair too, though, again, you know, in the military, you do have situations like this because, see, you know, a good junior officer understands. Yes, you are officially over the senior yeah. enlisted, but if you're smart. You listen to them. You defer <laughs> right. to them until you get a little more time in the military. Then you can start flexing your authority. I also get the sense that Starfleet plays fast and loose with that. Too. Yeah, but I, I, I don't know. I, I, I understand if you're a smart officer, you're going to listen to the non-coms. Yep. That doesn't mean that it's a good idea for the non-coms to <laughs> Agreed. totally Agreed. step on your line right. and not even acknowledge they're doing it. Exactly. Oh no, I agreed. And again, you know, yeah, that, that's that works both ways. But mm-hmm. now, at the same time, it, it, it's generally kind of understood. Let's just put it that way. By the way, the hunter in this episode is played by Garrett Graham, who yep. you may find familiar because he's also Q in the Voyager episode Death Wish. He's the Q yep. that wants to be allowed to die. He's actually that's in several right. several episodes. Uh, he he guests on some things, but yeah, yeah, that's one where you'll recognize him. Uh, the Tosk, played by Scott McDonald, he the Scott McDonald had a bunch of guest appearances on TNG, Voyager, DS9, and Enterprise. On Voyager, in the Caretaker episode, his that that's his only non covered in makeup mm-hmm. appearance, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, where he that's plays funny. Ensign Rollins, who takes command of the Voyager while the senior officers are away, and that's it. <laughs> it's the only time we ever see him in, in, without makeup. Hmm. So. So the both of these actors are Star Trek veterans. Uh, so so was, we 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 talked about in Doctor Who how there are limited faces in the universe. Apparently, Star <laughs> Trek has the same issue. That's right. That's right. So uh, I, I I did want to mention how poorly O'Brien treats uh, Quark throughout this episode. I mean, he's really mm-hmm. nasty to him at times. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, he he tells him to shut up at the beginning of this uh, scene. I mean, it's really uh, kind of interesting to to how the. 
I mean, they don't. They becomes friendlier. Everyone becomes friendlier toward Quark as things go on, but they they don't trust him, of course. But but right, they they get less nasty to him, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. So O'Brien, of course, risks his career, as you said, uh, Chekhov's gun. He risks his career. He sets a trap for the hunter by that the the weapon detecting thing now becomes a weapon blasting thing the, the at the entrance to the airlock. Um, lies about having orders from Cisco. Assaults the hunter. Luckily, Slugs him. Yeah. Luckily, Cisco goes along with it and tells he he and ops. He tells Odo, who's about to go track them that, down yeah. and arrest them. Yeah, don't hurry. You know, take your time. I, I, Odo's that's saunters. a great scene because Odo kind of looks at him, turns around, and just takes a nice leisurely <laughs> slow up to the turbo lift. <laughs> yes, mm-hmm. and in the end, everyone... and, and this is what the hunter wants. The hunter right. immediately whips out his cell phone and says, "The hunt has resumed." Right, the hunt is on. Uh, and, and in the end, everyone's happy with the outcome. Tosk, the Hunters, Cisco, O'Brien, everybody sort of gets what they want, uh, if not mm-hmm. in complete, completely. Now, Cisco gives O'Brien a good dressing down, as he should. Understandably. Uh, yeah, but and he notes that uh, O'Brien notes that Cisco didn't do all he could to stop him. And Cisco sort of says, oh, is that right? And then after O'Brien leaves the office, he grins to himself uh, yeah. that, yes, and he lets the it- audience know. It, it's a complex scene in that, you know, he is disciplining O'Brien and he even says, mm-hmm. if this happens again, something like this, you, I'm going to have you reassigned. You're not going to be here yep. anymore. Right. But he also, he knows and O'Brien knows that he let him do this because right. he yeah. could have stopped him and he didn't. And, uh, and even though Cisco will not admit that he helped, O'Brien still knows it and thanks him for it before he leaves. Mm-hmm. And so there's it's very subtle inter- interchange here between the two characters. Right, right. Uh, and it's a, and it really sets the sets the tone for their relationship and for O'Brien's yep. place in things going forward. He's he's willing to kind of do things that may not be technically by the book at all times and Cisco's right. sometimes willing to overlook those things if it's possible. Uh, to, for him to do so, and, and you know, if you give him, if you give him the 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 leeway to overlook the things without openly flouting orders, uh, mm-hmm, he'll right. he'll overlook it. So it's it it this does is one another one of those early episodes that really kind of sets the tone for these characters and who they're going to be and how things will will happen. Mm-hmm. So, uh, any other notes on this episode, mm-hmm. Father? Father? Okay. okay. Nope, I, I had a I had a few. Um, so one thing that we probably should make clear is what would happen to Tosk if they took him back to their own culture is he was going to be humiliated for the rest of his life. Right. He would be put on public display. Children would make fun of him and he would be basically humiliated for the rest of his life. So that's the fate that motivates O'Brien to do what he does. Right. Given the immorality of what their, this culture has done to engineer intelligent prey that wants to be uh, preyed upon, it makes Tosk a sad but noble figure. He's an innocent, and he's a victim of this twisted genetic manipulation. It's really great, though, once O'Brien gets him out, to really see him in action yeah. as the hunt resumes. And suddenly he's, I mean, he's been a fish out of water. The whole time in this episode, he doesn't know this strange new culture. He needs help. He doesn't understand what's happening around him. And then suddenly he's in his own element and he is yeah. a very effective uh, at avoiding, at, uh, you know, counterpunching uh, mm-hmm. and dealing with the hunters and evading them. And, you know, he eventually, he actually kills the head hunter, so it seems. Right. Right. Then he flees in his ship. And so. You know, the goal of a Tosk in life is to evade, 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 do everything you can to survive as long as possible and make the hunt as interesting as possible until the the day they get you. And the Mm -hmm. nice thing is here, they don't get Tosk. So in your own headcanon, you can imagine he's still out there and (laughs) still evading and still making it an awesome hunt for these guys and still being the best Tosk ever. And so that's kind of why, and I, I don't see, he's such a great character that I just really like him. I mean, he's mm-hmm. he's an innocent, he's likable, he's, even though he's a victim, he's also, you know, doing what he's passionate about and he does it well. And he is like the greatest character who should never, ever come back because <laughs> anything they did with this character afterwards would be a letdown. Yes, yes. Now, 
uh, interesting to compare Tosk to another prey species that has been bred to be prey in Star mm. Trek. The Kelpians in Discovery. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Like we, we I have like Tosk crit- better. I was going to say, yeah, we've exactly. been critical of the Kelpians as this passive prey species, whereas right. Tosk is a prey species that's designed to fight back. Mm-hmm. Uh, although later on in Discovery that maybe it turns out they're not so passive and they, yeah, but, they kind of ameliorate or they weren't or they weren't originally or, you know, yeah. Yeah. As a concept and just in terms of, I mean, I like Saru as a character. Yeah. But as a concept, I like Tosk better than I like the Kelpians. Yeah. Right. So a couple final notes. Uh, speaking of, of you know, the characters who should never return. Um, in the Deep Space Nine novel, Rising Sun, S-O-N, uh, a Tosk uh, comes back, a different mm-hmm. Tosk. Mm-hmm. Um, also, according to certain sources within DS9's production crew, uh, the Hunters were supposed to come back as members of the Dominion, but their role was cut from that the uh, the episode. Um, hmm. Interesting. And, and they did explain unofficially, established unofficially, that whoever bred the tusk for the hunters also bred the Jem Hadar. So that's oh. that's so those are some of the connections. That's all background, never been established mm-hmm. officially on screen, but but so mm-hmm. kind of interesting there. So uh yeah. that does address some of the things that we were talking about. All right. So um that's Caps of Pursuit. Uh, on the whole, I like you mentioned, Jimmy, I like this one of my favorite first season episodes, much better than some and and uh Oh absolutely. Uh, <laughs> some that shall remain nameless so far. It's notable, despite the fact that Deep Space Nine has a shakier opening season, like most Star Treks, mm-hmm. um, except for the first, it has a better first ratio season. of good episodes in its first season right. than Next Generation or Voyager does. Right. Maybe that says how bad some of the first season episodes become as well. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, I mean, yes. The, some of them <laughs> d- are, are, are just long, last long in memory, but uh, yeah. All right, so uh, let's. We should probably wrap it up there. Well, uh, before we do, we'll take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek, including Pat S, Joseph S, Philip C, Father Terence, and Anusha M. Their generous donations at sqpn.com/give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com/give. And we'd also like to thank Victor Lambs, who edits the show for us every week. So that's it from us. What did you think of Captive Pursuit? Let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash trek, or our Facebook page at facebook.com slash starquestmedia, or via email to trek at sqpn.com. We'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the Voyager episode, Ex Post Facto. Until then, Father Corey Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Well, thank you, Dom. And Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thanks, Dom, and live long and prosper. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, in contrast to what you just said, Jimmy, die with honor, Tosk. <laughs>